Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, got your attention. I appreciate it. My name is Mike Butterworth. I'm the director of the Center for Sports Communication and Media, which is uh, one of the uh, many centers and institutes in the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, it's my pleasure, my privilege to uh, welcome our guests today and to welcome you here to an event called Broken Trust sports in the Me Too era. Uh, we're all well too familiar with the stories that have emerged connected to USA Gymnastics, Michigan State University, Baylor University, any number of other institutions, where uh, all too often we're having conversations about sexual abuse and sexual discrimination in sports. It's our task today not to solve that problem in a single panel, of course, but to try to have an honest conversation about the dynamics that give rise to abuse and discrimination and to give voice to the experiences of those athletes who have uh, lived through that, uh, who survived those experiences, and who have become advocates on behalf of other athletes uh, who are uh, perhaps facing those situations now. Uh, it's my job to uh, welcome you, uh, to introduce you to the panel, uh, and to essentially then uh, allow the voices of the panelists to drive the conversation from here. I want to just offer a couple of really quick comments before we begin the program. Um, uh, first of all, when we resume, we're going to start with a, a short uh, film, uh, a short clip. Uh, it's about 15 minutes long, and it's going to set up the context for much of the conversation. Uh, and I do want to uh, introduce that by saying this of the clip and of the conversation. Much of what we will be talking about today is not easy. And uh, we recognize that that will be uh, emotionally taxing in different ways for different people. And if at any time, uh, what is uh, either on screen or as part of the discussion, if that's uncomfortable um, or unsettling, we respect that. Please don't feel like you can't get up and leave um, if you need to step out and come on back. Uh, we do hope you'll come back, of course, because we'd like to have you as part of the conversation. Uh, but that, that's a necessary part of this conversation. This is not easy. Uh, when we come back from uh, watching those 15 minutes, uh, the first person you'll hear from will be Jill Desco. And I'm going to then uh, leave it to Jill when we come back uh, to take it from there. But uh, Jill, who is uh, seated at the end uh, of the row here, is a fellow of the Center for Sports Communication and Media. Uh, she is a filmmaker uh, based in Baltimore and a former uh, elite cyclist uh, in her own right. And uh, we had Jill here about a year ago for a panel uh, connected to uh, another documentary she directed called Tainted Blood about uh, doping scandals in the 1984 Olympics in the US uh, cycling team. Um, this panel today is inspired by her current film project, which is called uh, Broken Trust. And so she is a definitive authority on this topic and has done so much of the work to gather the voices that you're here uh, today. So with that, I am uh, going to step aside. We'll start the, the uh, film clip, and then I'll turn it over to Joe from there. So thank you all again so much for being here. We appreciate it. I knew it was wrong, but he was my coach. I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't say no. After day. He touched me. I knew it was wrong, but he was my coach. I couldn't tell anyone. He touched me. I knew it was wrong, but he was my coach. I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't say no. After days of powerful testimony, former gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser was sentenced to life in prison yesterday. In the athletic world, you don't know anything other than what your coach tells you. When you're a 14-year-old girl and this is your life, you don't know what is abusive. When a coach is sleeping with an athlete, it doesn't just affect that athlete. It causes toxicity within the dynamic of the entire team. I wanted to be good. I wanted to be successful and he made me feel that he was the coach that could make me win. Someone that I trusted more than almost anyone in the world ended up being someone who hurt me so immensely. This is an intimidation issue. This is a sexual harassment issue and it should be treated as such. Abusers, your time is up. The survivors are here, standing tall, and we are not going anywhere. I'm an athlete, I'm a fighter, I'm a survivor. Enough 
is enough. I began skating at the age of five. The, the, the story that's told to me, because I don't remember back that far, is uh, from my mother, is that uh, she took me to the doctor. I had feet that were turned in. And so the doctor said to her, said to her you need to put him in activities that turn his legs out. And if you keep him in those activities, uh, by doing that, uh, and since he's so young, that'll fix his, uh, his problem. So that's what I'm told is, is how I got into ice skating. I had se several skating coaches growing up. I had one when I was uh, a young boy until I was maybe 10 or 11. Then I, I went to a, a different coach. I honestly don't know why. I, I think it's because I went upgraded quality. Uh, and then uh, for some, then I switched to another coach for a year, and then I switched to Richard Callahan, who was my coach from the time I was 13 until I retired when I was 24. What potentially makes an athlete vulnerable around a coach is what we as coaches ask our athletes to do. What I mean by that is we ask our athletes to trust us 100%. Without that trust or that commitment from the athlete doing what the coach asked them to do, it's very, very difficult to, to get the success that, the, that we have in mind for that athlete. So if an athlete truly wants to be as great as they, they say they do, they have to trust 100% what the coach has to say. This obviously has inherent risks, and if a coach decides to abuse that trust that the athlete has in them, they have a, it's, it's much easier to do because of that uh, relationship. I was 13 years old, I began being, I began coached by Richard Callahan. Before I was 14, or maybe by the time I was 14, I remember, uh, I, I remember having, um, uh, I, I have memories of going into his office and spending a large amount of times in his office where he would show me, show me pornographic magazines, ask me questions about whether I masturbated, showed me how to masturbate, asked me the next day when he'd bring me in the office if I had masturbated since the last time I saw him. To me, those are, that's sexual abuse right there. Maybe not in a legal sense, but, but, but in the, the abuse, I think, is less about the actual sexual gratification, although I do think that that is part of, part of it, and, but more about the, the, the controlling your every movement and your, and your every thought. And, and centering those thoughts towards the, 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 the coach so they could push your buttons. You know, and as, as a coach, you want to learn about your athlete so you can get them to perform on command, maybe, so to speak. And this is just some sick, twisted way to get your athletes to, uh, to perform on command. So, so from the time I was 13, I, I felt sexually abused. Uh, uh, as the as the years went on, uh, it graduated to to oral sex. It graduated to anal sex. It graduated to well, it's no it's no graduation after that, I guess, right? Um, but uh, the 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 abuse then occurred hundreds of times uh, at competitions in his, in his office, in his car, uh, in his house. Uh, in uh, we'd go to bars together from the time I was 16 and, and get, get drunk and do whatever it is on that spectrum, um, either on the way home, um, innuendos while I'm training as to, you know, uh, about masturbation and things like that while I'm, you know, while I'm training, I'm like during sessions. It was, it was, it, it, you know, it permeated pretty much, there was never a moment in, I can't think of a moment in my life where I would, where I would call myself uh, uh, safe or, or away from it. It was, it was, it was, it was part of my everyday uh, uh, regimen. I made my original complaint in 1999 to U.S. figure skating, and it took them 19 years to finally uh, get Richard Callahan banned from coaching in figure skating. As a coach who's been uh, abused, I think I, 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 I feel I'm much more sensitive 
to paths that lead that potentially lead to situations like this. Um, f getting too familiar with your with your athlete, uh, spending too much time with them, uh, 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 getting too uh, cozy with even the parents of the of the athlete, to me are all potential signs that that and potential risks that are shouldn't be taken by a coach is not a role to be a good coach means in my opinion first and foremost to have a passion for what you are coaching in order to have knowledge in order to have uh, dedication you have to love what you're doing and so you have to have a passion for it you have to have a desire to to be successful at it and I don't mean in terms of results I mean in terms of in terms of what you give to the to your athlete do you do you make them love what they what they do do you make them want to be more dedicated to uh, to their craft that to me is the biggest uh, attribute a coach can give I don't know about other sports but in figure skating our success is tied in many ways to the success of our athletes if we have an athlete that achieves an Olympic gold medal, we're considered a better coach. If we have an athlete that, that achieved, that goes to the U.S. National Championships or does something like that, we're considered a better coach. So it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, to be able to put your athlete first and do what's best for them because that may not be in line with what's best for your career. I'm, was very heartened when this we call it the hashtag me too movement started uh, and and even more emboldened when the gymnasts came forward because that happens to be very closely associated with figure skating uh, against larry nasser what can we do moving forward to make sure that this ha doesn't happen or doesn't happen as much i think education is for sure the 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 number one uh, number one thing we can do if we talk about this more and we educate people more on, on the signs and there and we give them a, a space or a uh, forum to be able to speak and to be able to talk without feeling uh, repercussions this will make it more difficult for predators my first swimming experience when i was like mm, probably like four or five um, my family left me alone in a swimming pool, which everybody says you should never, ever do. And, um, but it was an oval shaped pool. And so I taught myself to, you know, kind of keep going further and further until I sort of taught myself how to swim. When I was an Olympic swimmer, I knew that my body didn't conform to what Madison Avenue was saying women's bodies were supposed to look like, but I loved it. I liked looking in the mirror and I loved, I was proud of what I looked like because I knew what it took for me to be able to get there. And, um, and I knew what it could do, and I was proud of what it could do. I went out to California, and I knew when I was going out to this coach, his name is Mitch Ivey, that he had a reputation as uh, wanting to date his younger swimmers. And I thought, well, it's not gonna affect me because I'm out of his age range. I was 21. So I went out there sort of my eyes open, but thinking, you know, it's not gonna be a problem. And he was, he was molesting my teammate, uh, Suzette Moran. And uh, she was 16 years old. And it, it just created havoc for everybody on the pool deck. It was very damaging for the whole team dynamic for him to have a favorite. And for, for them, what was, what was unique about Mitch Ivey was he never hid it. So he would say, this is my girlfriend. And they roomed together. And she was underage. And she told her parents, if you don't let me date him, I'm going to run away. And there was no cultural expectation that this was prohibited, not just because it's illegal, because it's right, but that coaches dated their athletes. And, um, you know, it really, it took us about 30 years to get him out of sport. And here's somebody who married three of his swimmers, the total of which did not equal one year. So he tended to marry them just as they became legal age, which sort of normalized abuse that had been happening when they were children. When sexual abuse gets revealed, okay, so when it comes to light, 
100% of the time, somebody tells me, and I'm like, I could tell you the end of the story. The team and other coaches will rally around him and they'll make all kinds of things. She threw herself at him. She, uh, right. And, but all these other athletes have staked their athletic careers on this coach. And so they want her to leave and they want him to stay. So even coaches who are in criminal court and are admitting to child sexual abuse will have the uh, bleachers full of their swimmers and other coaching friends who will be supportive of him and really leaving the victim out in the cold. That has to change. There are three ways that we normally protect people all throughout society from sexual abuse. So children, we protect them by having very strict rules about how adults are allowed to interact with them in youth serving organizations. Sport got out from under that so that parents are not allowed to be around and uh, coaches have free access to be able to be around athletes by themselves for long periods of time. Two is whenever there's a power differential, we put very bright line rules on uh, people with their license. So me as a lawyer or uh, a doctor or a therapist or a religious leader or uh, a prison guard, we say that you're not allowed to practice that profession if you're going to uh, have sex with your clients or your patients or whoever. Sport doesn't have any civil right that protects them. Coaches don't lose any of their their license to be able to coach if they have sex with their athletes. And the normal rules on dealing with children don't seem to apply. So, uh, so there's, uh, you know, and that's why it's so important to have that really bright line rule that every coach and every seven year old understands that coaches shall not have romantic or sexual relationships with the athletes they coach, regardless of age, or consent, that it is a do not pass go. Do, don't, don't look for your romantic partner from within the athletes you coach. Now we have created this new United States Center for Safe Sport and we're not there yet, but we're on our way to creating this database, but right now it doesn't exist. But what we don't wanna have happen is to get a coach banned in the United States and that coach can just hop over and we won't, don't wanna be an exporter of sexual abusers. We don't want these child molesters to be able to go anyplace else around the world. There has to be an international remedy. They're at the International Olympic Committee has to take this as seriously as it takes doping. In 2014, I started a new organization called Champion Women, and we provide the legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. So when there's a conflict or when a woman, when, when sexism, interferes with women's ability to participate in sports or her ability to get treated the same way or her ability to get a scholarship, um, whether it's pregnancy discrimination or employment discrimination, uh, female coaches, um, that's, that's our bailiwick, that's what we do. The, the issue of sexual abuse in the Olympic movement has been going on for decades, and, but it didn't sort of bubble up to this level. Um, and, so the only way to do that is to have a sort of rethinking of how athletes are treated and how the Olympic Committee has a relationship with athletes. Right now, as an example, athletes cannot appoint who they want to on the board, on the USOC board. They don't have a vote. They can't be involved really in policy making how the USOC spends its money. Athletes don't have a vote. A lot of people think that if we just get rid of Larry Nassar and the people who enabled him, that, that that's gonna solve the problem, right? So dump bump and we can go back to business as usual. And we cannot do that. This is a, an opportunity here to really empower athletes. to Michael and to Chris Hart and everybody at, at the center. I'm delighted to be here um, to return to Austin. I'm gonna uh, let the, I'm Jill Yesko. I'm gonna have our panelists do a brief introduction of themselves and then we'll dive into the discussion. Eva. I'm Eva Lewinsky. I was a World Cup three-shooter for the USA in 2001. 
to 2005. And I'm here to talk a little bit about um, the damaging effects that occurred when the team director, longtime national team coach and team director, um, was having serial affairs with um, women that he was coaching or had authority over for about 20 years. Um, and just some other aspects of training in an Olympic sport and the abuses of power that go on that enable this type of abuse. Some people call me a whistleblower. I prefer, prefer to call myself an advocate. I've also written a book about speed skating, um, my experiences in speed skating called Winter of Discontent, and I've also helped other athletes find resources to help them take a stand against abusive coaches. Hi, my name is Jessica Armstrong. I'm a former elite swimmer, and I was sexually abused by my coach um, through the uh, 12 and 14. And <clears throat> I'm here today to talk about uh, how we change um, the way that Hi, I'm uh, Catherine Starr. Um, uh, went to UT here, was on three national championship teams, so uh, <laughs> go, go Horns. Um, and uh, I um, uh, was on uh, two uh, British Olympic teams in 84 and 88. And uh, during that time, uh, I was uh, sexually abused by my coach, who was also the head Olympic coach uh, on the British national team. Um, I started an organization in uh, 2011, um, uh, in April of 2011, uh, called Safe for Athletes, um, and we didn't roll out our policies until uh, January of 2012, which was about a month, 11-11, uh, 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 2011 is uh, the date that the Jerry Sandusky uh, uh, case was revealed. Um, and we started um, an organization with uh, addressing policy. And I worked um, uh, on many legal cases as an expert, both I've written for uh, Senate hearings, I've, I've worked with various uh, uh, senators, I've, I've uh, addressed state laws uh, across this country um, to change uh, legal age of uh, consent, um, and uh, been uh, heavily involved um, doing what I've worked sexual harassment then as well. So anyway, um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. I'm uh, Mary Angela Bach. Uh, I teach uh, here in the Moody College at the uh, School of Journalism. Um, I do research on uh, visual representation primarily, uh, but with an interest in how visual representations of people uh, of color and women uh, affect the way we think uh, about uh, people. Uh, and I'm also very interested in how the language that we use uh, about uh, people of color and women, athletes, sexual abuse, and how language affa affects what we think and uh, about uh, these kinds of issues. Um, and uh, I was never an athlete. <laughs> I almost wasn't allowed to be an athlete, uh, but uh, I, I have been bullied uh, in meet days. Um, and so I have a kind of a different flavor of, of Me Too kinds of stories to tell. Am I allowed to say this? Okay. Um, my name is Jessica Luther. I'm a freelance journalist here in Austin, and I am the author of a book called Unsportsmanlike Like Conduct, College Football and the Politics of Rape. Uh, it's some of my freelance work that I'm best known for. Uh, in August of 2015, my reporting partner, Dan Sullivan, and I wrote the first major piece about uh, Baylor and football and sexual assault. It was the, I'm never going to get the quote right, Ken Starr called it the Texas monthly suggestion. Uh, that is the reason that he um, uh, hired the outside law firm that eventually brought all their stuff back that ended up in our Bryles being fired and the athletic director being suspended and he left and then of course Ken Starr eventually left as well. And then uh, early last 
last year, I co-wrote a piece with John Wertheim in Sports Illustrated about the Dallas Mavericks and sexual harassment and uh, domestic violence uh, among the business side of their staff. And late last year, I wrote a piece on Texas A&M and their Title IX policies and the survivors on that campus who pushed the school very quickly to uh, look at their policies and change them. Well, thank you, everybody. We have um, not a lot of time to delve into uh, a really rich and sometimes very disturbing topic. But um, I want to start with, um, with Jessica and open this up to the whole group. I think, um, you know, as you saw in the clip, um, Craig Marisi, I honor his um, honesty in coming forth and talking about how he was abused by his, his coach. And I wonder if uh, one of the issues here that, that gets in our way in talking about Me Too is how little consensus there is about the term sexual violence. And um, particularly since we're at the School of Communications, are we using the right languaging to talk about this, this important topic? You wanted to start with Jessica? Jessica, yeah, can we go down the line with that? I think, I mean, this is a great question because it is complicated, right? Um, so many of the things that we put under the umbrella of sexual assault or gendered violence are related to each other, but there's also an entire spectrum of things underneath that word, right? Um, and so I do think it's important that we have umbrella terms, that we can say all of these actions are related to each other, which could be non-consensual kissing all the way up to rape, right? Like you can have a variety of things that fall under that um, that can mean just similar responses from the people they happen to that are harmed by them. Um, at the same time, I think when we're talking about individual cases, I do think it matters that we're addressing um, what actually happens to people and the specifics of those things. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a complicated question and I think it's a hard one to deal with, especially for someone like me who is often trying to pick my words correctly in order to get across what I'm trying to say, not sensationalize it as well, how much you say about it, um, but also to be true about what's actually happening to people. There's, uh, there's a lot involved with language uh, and how we talk about the issue and, and also how, um, how we describe things. And um, I think to call it sexual abuse is uh, often makes people think about rape, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily about molestation, not necessarily about the intensive bullying, pressure kind of flirting that can go on for a long time before even touching happens. Um, and it also does not really address how the rest of the team is affected, um, how having one particular person who's being groomed for abuse uh, affects the team uh, and other, the other people. So I think maybe sexual abuse is kind of limiting uh, to our discussion. Yeah. What, would, what other terms would you suggest? Well, I think that there's exploitation, mm -hmm. uh, there's bullying, there's abuse of power. Um, there's abuse of station, there's uh, abuse of, uh, so abuse is a pretty good umbrella term perhaps, um, but when, when people think sexual abuse, they usually, the first thing to their mind is, is rape or sexual molestation with contact. Um, and it doesn't, I think it doesn't even start there. And, and when you think about it, when that sort of hyper-sexualized atmosphere is happening with around a team, everybody's affected whether they're touched or flirted with or not, because what that means is that women are less valued, or children are less valued, or a particular class of people is less valued. And so we have to, I think, talk about the value of people and the humanity of people in general, as well as talking about the abuse cases. Well, I think, so uh, a couple things. One, I was in, involved in a, a legal case, and the issue became, um, uh, signing a liability waiver and that the uh, uh, other side was arguing that the, there was inherent risk of sexual abuse in sport. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the language in the, in the legal language to use is non-accidental harm. Um, <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, you know, so the fact that you have to explain that in the sports system is a uh, certainly a significant problem, but cycling it back into um, and, and wrapping it around 
the issue of sport. Um, and, it, and Craig also said it, you know, sort of the power dynamic that you are existing with and, and how does the power get developed and how does the power get created, which is, y y you know, you talk about, um, you know, your goals and the Olympic movement and everything else and try to understand that. And so, um, but going into the word sexual abuse, when I first wrote policies and when I was involved in uh, Donna Lopiano is former athletic director here who helped uh, start um, Safer Athletes. Um, I was, I d didn't like the language because I felt it wasn't clear, it didn't articulate the harm that had caused an individual. Um, and so in a lot, and I think actually originally it was started off when I first started as misconduct. Mm -hmm. And that's often the language that's used within the university system, within, um, which is used within uh, uh, the workplace environment, they reference the word uh, in, in such um, uh, a dismissive way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, is very harmful for the society and the community at large to uh, comprehend the harm and the destruction and really taking away um, an individual's ability to participate in life at their, uh, at, at, at an adequate ability. Uh, a lot of sexual abuse survivors don't become as, sexual, as, um, as successful as someone might just to be able to become a, a lawyer. A lot of them are underemployed um, and uh, you know, barely can even participate in the workforce and barely have a voice left today. So the language to, so everybody can understand the significance of harm I think is, is very pertinent I think that's interesting you bringing up the law because I do think the legal system also sets the language a lot. Um, media often takes cues from like we explain things the way that the law explains them. And so um, most states have sexual assault laws, right? They don't necessarily have rape laws. And so uh, everything gets flattened in, in that way. And then the media is recreating the language that the law is giving them. Um, and so that's, it's just interesting to think about sort of how that sort of leads a lot of how we even think about it. A lot of people begin and end their conversation around sexual violence through the law courts. Yeah. Well, as, as a lawyer and a survivor, what say you, Jessica? I think language is really important. And if you can't um, name something, you can't talk about it. And I think what, what the um, Nasser um, abuse cases have really helped us with is to put words to this this you know type of behavior and um, when you listen to 30 statements by women or I think there were 100 statements by women describing sexual abuse um, in really graphic terms you know I think everybody in this room probably um, can can think about one of those girls talking about you know Larry Nasser touching their vagina so that's really graphic but it also helps it helps us put into context um, what is happening and you know what these young women have experienced so I think to your point Jessica when you say that the media um, takes its cues from the law um, I also think that the media can help by exposing and by put, giving giving people language to talk about it there were many years that I was unable to say I was sexually abused by my coach I can say that easily now because because it's a more common thing that people are talking about. But when this first happened to me, I had no words for this, and my parents had no words for it. And so it, it really uh, kept things um, from, from being um, exposed. Eva, you want to weigh in on this? Just a few things to add. I think that Me Too is a term that encompasses all forms of sexual misconduct that can take place. I, was, I consider myself a third party victim of sexual abuse going on on a team. And I don't feel comfortable using the words sexual abuse or sexual violence to explain what I went through because it devalues the experiences of all women who were actually raped or molested. And yet we have to find ways of talking about the very real abuses of power that also go on. Yeah. Well, I think that, that dovetails nicely into the next question. I want to start with, with you as kind of like a, a drive-by victim, you know, mm -hmm. as, as it were. Um, we know that abuse can come in many guises, not necessarily sexual. 
certainly emotional, um, bullying, but also financial. Can you talk a little bit about what you experienced as, um, you know, that was not overtly sexual abuse in your sport and how that affected your whole team? Yes, like for example, abuse that I or others have experienced, um, emotional abuse. Um, some of the women were called fat pigs, fat cows. Um, the short track national team coach who was abusive once on a competition trip saw some of his women eating pizza for dinner and he made them go and walk around late at night to walk off the pizza for two hours um, the night before a competition. Um, athletes would get the silent treatment. Um, I had actually the, the team director who was sleeping with my rival, he would play head games with me he would sit down with me before a race at breakfast and want to talk about how I lost my job the summer before because my lab where I was working lost funding and shut down. Um, he only liked to shake my hand when I would lose um, because he liked to get right up close and see the look in my eye. Um, financial abuse, our stipends for being on the World Cup team were 150 bucks a month, so you really couldn't even stop working even though you were training full time. Um, we had sponsor deals negotiated behind our backs and then we're, we were basically forced to wear the team logos while getting nothing in return. I was once told that in order to get my racing suits for a competition that I qualified for, I would have to sign my name to an athlete agreement which was essentially a blank piece of paper of which the full ramifications and details hadn't been worked out yet. Um, and I said I wasn't gonna do that and I just went in and got my racing suit. Um, just all of these things that, that would happen. Athletes would have their stipends taken away if they complained too much and the Federation saw them as subversive, um, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's a real commodification of being, being an athlete. I know that there has been some talk about athletes forming a union. Do you feel that under the current system um, as under the USOC, because I know you, um, Catherine, are, you have a voice. Are athletes treated um, in a way that honors the athletes? So I, um, so I uh, just need a quick thing. So when I competed, um, it was strictly amateur. And so you still saw the same kind of abuse uh, that you see today, but you have a new level of integrated abuse, which is um, the financial aspect of it, which act actually makes you more vulnerable uh, to being in abusive situations as a result. So I haven't seen um, and would like to see to have more policies set um, around um, uh, athlete protection, same type of um, uh, you know representation requirements, um, as well as um, uh, uh, education with athletes around vulnerabilities in this area. And, and you know, you can, whether you find it in a union, whether it's a requirement or whether it's the obligation of somebody, uh, an institution um, like the United States Olympic Committee, I also think the NCAA has a, a responsibility in this area, why these are all uh, student um, uh, or student athletes. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that they're, they've been uh, marginalized as well. Um, so I really think a lot of things around sport um, that are more, that the, the, the power shift needs to switch over to the athlete mm -hmm. uh, versus to the institution. And so, and that's where I feel um, uh, more time and energy and focus needs to happen on what those solutions are. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you, um, and uh, when you don't have an athlete's voice, I mean that's, I didn't have voice, Jessica didn't have voice, like anybody, in, if you didn't have a voice that was really being recognized. And, and we have this um, idea that while sport <coughs> is entertainment, mm -hmm. um, it, it, without the athletes, you would have nothing. You know, so we really, um, I, I feel a lot of work and, yeah. and uh, uh, mindset needs to be um, focused in that area. I want to go back to um, the role of, of coaches since um, a lot of my film will, will focus on that and coaches are really central to the, I mean, the athlete coach relationship should be a sacred relationship but nine times out of ten it is a, an unbalanced power dynamic. Um, I know 
you, Jessica, have written about this. Eva, you have experienced this. And I think you, Jessica, as well, in, in some way, that how it seems that athletes and certainly coaches are so easily able to escape prosecution or any kind of ramification by hopscotching from team to team, from one part of the country to the other, even um, exporting themselves abroad. Um, can you talk about how, uh, oh, this is for all of you, how and why this, this happens and what we can do about it? I'll start with you, Eva, because you have very direct experience with this. Yes, so when um, the team director, former team director of US speed skating, Michael Crow, was fired from US speed skating in 2006, um, I couldn't really tell exactly what it was a result of, but I had written a letter to the USOC ombudsman about this, and I had blogged about his sexual favoritism and how it affected our team. There was nothing that ever came out in the media from US speed skating that amounted to any sort of announcement as to why he was fired and that it was anything related to that. There was no requirement for this information to be posted anywhere. And so when Speed Skating Canada wanted to hire him, they had no reason to suspect that there was anything wrong with that because nothing came up on a background check. And um, it is also thought that the person who hired him there was someone that he had worked with previously. So it was the hiring was done by a friend. Um, and so I think it's important to have banned lists and to have this information be available. And I think it's important for the other organizations to actually do background checks that are thorough at the time of hiring and also to do repeated background checks like when people come up for promotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like Nancy so Hogs had said, mm -hmm. you know, sports somehow got out from under the protocols that we hold e pretty much everything else in, you know, employment, um, certainly um, the medical profession. What were you? So um, actually background checks, while they are a good place to start, they are not um, anything to, to fall back on. Um, so most of the abuse happens uh, within the system and it doesn't come up into a legal standard. So um, it, it within the sports community, um, it's a, a, a reasonable uh, doubt uh, it's not, it's, um, it's um, preponderance, which is 50% in a feather. Um, and so, as, as it was described to me, uh, versus a criminal standard, which you're gonna have beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, which is like 99% believable. So, um, and you, you're not gonna be able to put most of this information, um, character, uh, uh, y you know, when you fall into, when you cate categorize um, molestation or, or uh, you know, touching, Various things, they just don't get into the criminal system. They're, they're, there's no room for it in, um, in the legal system because uh, there's more egregious situations that they're dealing with. Um, and then within the sports environment, they've only recently done it within doing the, you know, having the center and then each individual sport uh, was at various, um, it, it, it inconsistent. So mm -hmm. how something was handled in curling was not how something was handled in gymnastics or something in speed skating versus swimming. Mm -hmm. So everything was handled with very different standards. Mm -hmm. So even with a background check, you weren't gonna have um, any type of consistency around coaching. And a lot of the information was um, uh, in somebody's head. It was not written down. It was not in some computer file. And mm -hmm. so going to the next coach, and, and we've also, the other thing I'm gonna add in here, there's confusion. There's very specific confusion is created within the environment to not allow the abuse to actually come out and to be a fact. So it stays in this circle of maybe, yes. you, in this circle of doubt. And that doubt, then you take on the doubt. Like, did that really happen? I know exactly where I was and what happened. But yet, there's this idea that if I just keep kind of like, you know, sending the lie down the river, then it's just gonna yeah. stay a lie. And if enough people believe the lie, it's gonna become a truth. Mary, you were gonna weigh in on that. Well, I just, I think that it's very interesting that we are celebrating women and victims, uh, male victims getting a voice in this and, and saying what happened to them. Uh, but at the same time, so little is being done for asking the entourages 
who enable this kind of abuse to use their voice to do something about it and keeping it secret mm -hmm. and kind of, oh, you know, we can't talk about, we might get sued, there might be liability, uh, mm -hmm. so we can't prove it. We can't prove it because this one person, this two, second person, this third person is making these accusations, but we can't prove it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't lead to some sort of legal certainty, so somehow Canada gets a coach because those voices <laughs> were quiet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think part of it, and we just have to say outright, is that these institutions are built so that there is no accountability. Uh, like you were just talking about, so you look at the USOC, they're in charge, and underneath them are the national governing bodies of each individual sport. They all have different rules. When something happens, the USOC says, oh, that's the NGV's problem. When something underneath the NGV happens, oh, that's the gym's problem. And it happens in the gym, oh, that's the coach's problem, right? Like, they move it down. We see this in the NCAA. The NCAA mm -hmm. is never, I mean, are they responsible for anything ever? No, it's the individual, it's at a conference, or it's the team. Yeah. And if it's on in the conference, then the conference puts it on the team. And then you get to the team, and it's, the, you know, the AD or the coach, or, and you just keep going down until you find the very bottom person on the rung. If you look at FIFA, uh, who mm -hmm. controls international soccer, they do the same thing. They have, they're, they're then split into their different categories around the world and they just push it down, right? There's a huge thing right now with the Afghanistan women's team and like who's responsible for taking care of the massive abuse that's happened on that team. Uh, and so we have an institutional setup in general, this bureaucracy that we find throughout sport that lends itself to no one ever being accountable. So when people move around, no one's ever at fault mm -hmm. for it, right? And so you see individual patchwork things. Um, I know college football the best, um, or college sports in general. We see individual conferences creating their own transfer rules, right? They only apply those to players, and they're very specific depending on the conference. What about the coaches, right? They, they don't have the same rules around the coaches, it's the players that they're scrutinizing all the time, um, which goes back to issues of how we think about race and criminality and all this stuff too. Um, and so you, again, you get sort of the passing of the buck and it is set up so that no one has to be in trouble ever. So, and I'm gonna make one statement of what I've written about is called institutional blindness. So yeah. very Institutional simple. blindness, yeah. yeah. And you've got this institutional blindness and you've got this passing of the buck uh, and this lack of accountability within a social system that devalues women. Right. So you've got this, this system that devalues women, that devalues people of color, that devalues children for as much as we talk about how yeah. children are the future, yeah. our society does not treat children as valuable. Yeah. Uh, so you've got that system, that social system, meeting an, an institutional system with no accountability. Uh, and it's it's small wonder we have the disasters that we have. Well, I absolutely agree with that because in speed skating, my experience was that U.S. speed skating protected Michael Crow because his men were winning. And so for years, it was an open secret about his misbehavior with women on that team, but they kept him. They protected him because his men were doing well, and they were okay with that, and so was the USOC. It's not just a coach. Um, whose male athletes are doing well. We were discussing this earlier, how Bella Caroli had been brought back a second time even after there were significant allegations against him. Can you discuss that a little bit more? Sure. So, uh, yeah, ha happy to. So, um, in uh, a quick history, so in uh, 1972 Olympics, the um, U.S. team did not perform uh, as, uh, it didn't, the medal count wasn't as good as it uh, had been in the past and so, at the time, there was the AAU who had a monopoly on sport. Uh, and so after that, in 1973, about March 8th, you can check it out on the congressional records, you'll see that the Amateur Sports Act was first started uh, in addressing, uh, to, to move it over in what in 1978 became the Ted Stevens Amateur Sports Act. So in part of this move from uh, moving away from AU and the, and the United States Olympic Committee becoming and par part of that act allows them to use the uh, full licensure of the Olympic rings and be able to determine um, which the f have full rights within each governing body uh, who does the Olympic trials. So, um, and so part of that uh, move was uh, c competition. It was all uh, not being competitive enough, so they moved sport off of the AAU and the Ted Stevens Amateur Sports Act started in 1978 and then then you became USA Gymnastics, USA Swimming and et cetera, et cetera. So they knew Bella Crowley wrote a book in the early 70s that 
completely describe how abusive he was as a coach. And that was what uh, USA Gymnastics chose to bring on board to, in, to be competitive in the sport. It was a predominantly Eastern uh, bloc, Eastern European bloc um, uh, athleticism. Um, and so we made decisions knowing that they were going to harm the athletes um, in the idea of competition. So w as an athlete coming into the situation, you already have like the bar to even complain has been raised so high that you, where, a, where you can define abuse was set up above an abusive standard. Mm -hmm. So for you to even be able to say anything uh, didn't allow you to really be considered an athlete, like coughing it up. You know? and, if you w and if you wanted to be good and you wanted to be selected for the national team, you were not gonna say anything about abuse in any way because then you would be, you would be dismissed and uh, you wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't take you seriously. And soft or uh, other, other derogatory comments to, to um, uh, question your athleticism. Yeah. And, and your, your commitment. It, yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think in the question of like, how did Larry Nasser happen, right? Which is, a, the numbers are just so staggering. Um, it's this, it's exactly that thing. Like how, are, how is a child supposed to understand abuse when everything they're experiencing within their sport is in some way a form of abuse? Like why is that abusive if, if this other thing is? And there was an ESPN article, um, I wanna say right around the time of the victim impact statement in court. It was a long piece, it was, um, and one of the things they brought, they wrote a lot about, I think one of the first places that really did this was John Getter who was the 2012 Olympic mm -hmm. uh, coach who mm -hmm. ran the, how do you say Twist it? Stars. Twist Stars. I always say, I always say Twist Stars. Twist Stars uh, gym in East Lansing that Nasser also worked at. And one of the women, I apologize for not knowing her name, uh, she had this quote that I'll like, never forget. She said that Getter was abusive in the way that the sort of uh, psychological, emotional abuse that even physical, like what he would force the girls to do bordered on physical abuse or was physical abuse. And she had a quote that would say that she said, uh, John would break us down and Larry would fix us. Mm -hmm. And I will just, I will never forget that. Mm -hmm. And so how all of this abuse wrapped into each other. Yeah. Well, and then you have the on top of that, just culturally across the board, uh, minors are labeled as liars. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the ability to one and women, especially and girls, women. and right. especially girls. Little so you're girls. Jessica yeah. talks about that in her book about yeah. how women are perceived as as liars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and so there's your challenge right there. So to get from fact to fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So I want to just back up a little bit um, and talk about the, the meta narrative here um, because as as a filmmaker when I I'm. So what you saw there was the trailer for the film and just a, a kind of a rough cut assemblage of two of the key interviews for, for the film. But in talking to people and putting the film together, um, people have asked me, who are you to make this film? Are you a survivor? What's, you know, do you have skin in the game? And you know, certainly as an athlete and a woman, I think, yeah, I've got skin in the game. You know, this, this needs to be seen. And I hope in the film that I will be able to bring this narrative beyond the sensational. You know, talk about how we can and must move forward from this. But what was posed to me was, who does control this narrative? Is it, should it be the survivors? Should it be the lawyers? Should it be, and I'm saying media and air quotes, because, I mean, really there are, unfortunately, so few working journalists these days as compared to their uh, 10 years ago. So and you're, who, who owns this narrative, if, if anybody? Well, I think one reason Me Too has been so powerful is it's right there in the name, uh, that Me Too, uh, that it's victims and survivors coming forward and speaking as one of the for all the hell that social media is, right? This is like one of the silver linings is that it gave people not only ability to tell their story unmediated, uh, but to tell it to each other and to be seen um, among, I mean, one of the things is when survivors hear someone explain that what happened to them was abusive and they see their own abuse story in that, they're like, 
because that's me. Like, that happened to me too. Um, and so that's been incredibly powerful. I, and so, I mean, we saw the sort of breakthrough the media moment when um, with the Stanford swimmer case, the Brock Turner case that most people are mm -hmm. familiar with, so I'm not gonna rehash the whole thing, but uh, he was convicted. Uh, and in, there was a victim impact statement that the woman read in court and she gave it to BuzzFeed and they published it in full and that went viral and we saw like a shift in how we talked about it because she was able to, again, unmediated, put her, her voice and her experience out there. Um, I mean, it should be. If you're asking should, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's who should be yeah. controlling the narrative. I mean, I'm super aware as, some, as a woman in sports journalism who writes on this topic, uh, you'll never find a whiter or maler group of journalists mm -hmm. than sports media. Uh, and that, and then at the same time, you, at least pre-Me Too, there was a report the Women's Media Center did that said that 25% of all stories about gender violence showed up in sports sections. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you're thinking about who's actually deciding which of those stories they will run uh, and how will they put them out there. And then we talk about the fact that SportsCenter barely shows female athletes at all. I think we're up to 4% of the time. Uh, and who's making, like, so whose stories are getting out there? How does that work? Um, we should constantly be thinking about that, especially when we, uh, especially within sports journalism. I, I appreciate you saying that it, that the voice of the survivors are important. And I, I, as a survivor, I agree with that. But I think that the narrative shouldn't be controlled by any one group. I think everyone's um, position as a, as a professor, um, as somebody who, you know, speaks about rhetoric and what language do we use as a journalist, as men, as men who might be um, wrongfully accused um, of, of sexual violence, um, of, you know, documentary producers. I think everyone's voice is really important in this narrative. I don't think there should be one voice. And that's what's great about this panel is you have, a, you know, different perspectives. And I know, Mary, you've written about the um, kind of invisibility of, of, of women <laughs> here. Yeah. It's interesting now, now that the survivors and the Me Too movement is becoming more visible and vocal, you're seeing the inevitable backlash. You know, for instance, the former interim president of Michigan State University said, you know, of Ali Reisman and her cohort, you know, they seem to be enjoying their, their moment too much. <laughs> Can you talk yeah. about that? Well, I, I, I think it, it gets to the notion that uh, women are like children. And so one of the ways that women have been re represented uh, over time, historically, uh, is, is an infanti infantilized way. Um, and because of that, when women complain about being abused, uh, then it's easy to stereotype them as whiners, as crybabies, or as liars, um, and it's easy to play to those stereotypes. Uh, women, uh, anybody who does not play, anybody, men, women, uh, white people, black people, who does not conform to a stereotype gets punished uh, in a social way. So when women do things that are stereotypically masculine, they get punished socially somehow. Uh, when men do things that are stereotypically feminine, uh, they get punished socially. And I think that uh, the, the you know, f pushback you know, is in part uh, allowable, you know, enabled, uh, energized by this idea uh, that women just want attention, they're crybabies, um, and they just want their own way. Or they stop want- Stop talking about it so much. Stop talking, oh, yeah, stop talking about it, because it's, it's making the men uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, well, and also I think that it, um, you mentioned who controls the narrative. I think um, that institutions and the institution's attorneys are so used to controlling the narrative mm -hmm. and squashing the voices of victims. Um, and then those victims are not able to get justice because the institutions have all the control. And the good thing is that when the stories, the La Larry Nassar scandal was so huge and it was so told in the media that that was the way that the survivors were then able to get justice. And then for Angler to then come and say that they're looking for attention was so disrespectful 
Yeah, I think by then the momentum had certainly moved, um, moved beyond that when you had what uh, more than a hundred, and, and you can watch the victim statements on YouTube. They're definitely hard to watch. Has uh, folks have you? nodding your heads, you've, you've watched them. Yeah, it's really, like your book, very, very tough, strong, but important, but important medicine. I know we've talked a lot about uh, the Olympic movement, but you've written very, very cogently about what goes on under um, NC, NCAA. Since, uh, when did your book come out? Uh, September 2016. Okay, so fairly recently, but even in that short time, have you seen any, any changes, perhaps as a result of Larry Nasser and, and MSU in the way <laughs> NC. Okay, uh oh, no, that's I, not good. Uh, I mean, right around the time that uh, around the time that we wrote the Baylor thing, which was in 2015, that's when we started to get these. SEC was the first conference to at least have a transfer rule mm -hmm. for for players when they would. Um, most of it's if if something happened within the criminal system, if they're they plead or they're convicted, um, but now also if, if a university finds them responsible for harming, but they can't transfer to an SEC school. Um, so we've seen conferences, the Big 12 after our stuff came out um, with Baylor. Um, there was an individual school, maybe Indiana, I'm sorry if I get that wrong, that has their own transfer rule. So we're seeing um, stuff like that. The NCAA, uh, I'm trying to say this the nicest way I can. Um, Oh, don't hold it doesn't that. seem to be a concern for them. Uh, they like to, again, like I said, they like to push it onto individual schools, but also they like to say that Title IX is a federal law, th that the school should be operating under this law, it doesn't matter for the NCAA. Uh, everyone's kind of waiting right now to see if they're actually gonna punish Baylor mm -hmm. um, for institutional failure or whatever it would be, but they don't actually have like a rule around sexual violence that they would be able to like hold on to, um, is and I, it, yeah. Is, this, is it true that you wrote in your book, as of 2016, no known school has lost funding due to Title IX? Yeah. By is that still true? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Title IX is blowing. just, for those who don't know, the 1972 statute that says that you can't discriminate uh, the educational institutions that take federal funding. So basically any grade school, any university college, vocational schools, uh, that they can't discriminate on the basis of sex. It's like, I don't know, is it 70 words long? I mean, it's a pretty short little thing and then it gets interpreted over time by the law, by courts and people sue under it and then by the Department of Education. Right now, it is rewriting the rules around it. Betsy DeVos's administration is going to give us new ones soon. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really only one punishment under Title IX and that's if you're found to be um, violating it, that they can take your money away. And as of now, no one has had, they've had it threatened, mm -hmm. but no one's ever actually been punished. Well, that's, to me, that's, that's just incredible. I can certainly see, see why that wasn't, hasn't been the case, but uh, you know, unless you take the money away, no one's gonna pay attention. And so that's one reason that you, people sue, right? Like that's mm -hmm. one uh, mm -hmm. way that, um, money becomes a factor yeah. that universities respond to. The other thing they don't like is they don't like bad PR, right? That's also mm -hmm. has to do with their pockets. And so, um, but yeah, as far as the law itself and the teeth behind it, it's, mm -hmm. it's not quite probably what people imagine. As I have found uh, dealing with, as being an expert on a lot of cases and done some Title IX cases, that um, it comes very difficult to sue, um, extremely difficult, um, also because of the money, it's state's money, right? And so there's this big, broader, uh, 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 less of accountability that other institutions are held to. So, um, you know, so the, they're, they're like this leeway that, um, uh, like this liability leeway is like extended in, personally in my opinion, it's very an unreasonable place. Um, but I also can tell you from uh, within um, the legal system with a lot of judges, uh, getting switched out and becoming more conservative judges that this uh, issue is actually getting addressed um, at better through the courts. Mm -hmm. So I think you're gonna find um, uh, under uh, previous administrations that they would have had, uh, you, you would never have seen Weinstein um, and that whole issue even come to light. 
So a lot of uh, sexual abuse, sexual um, uh, minors, uh, anything around the sexual abuse aspect is really being addressed in a much more uh, 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 stricter, uh, uh, constringent way than you've ever seen before. And I see that as a progression to move mm -hmm. forward because when I started uh, Safe for Athletes, it was like, you know, may I need to like educate the judges or something. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them, and if you look at the Sandusky uh, situation, um, that the, uh, he had a foundation and the judge that was, uh, was on his board of directors, right? So there was a huge conflict of interest, you know, with a lot of this stuff. So, um, y you know, so when you start looking at sort of the, the, the system does not support removing abuse in any way, shape, or form, then you see it how it stays in the system because there isn't really an avenue to remove it out. Um, so it, when the whole thing needs to be eradicated and changed. And I, I see a lot of those uh, changes uh, moving forward in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. But it's taken the Me Too movement. It's taken uh, you know, the, the Larry Nassar situation um, to really have that kind of level of media attention for these changes to have a meaningful, and people are wiser and they've woken up to the issue. Yeah. And I think that certainly there's been a lot of foot dragging, I guess that's a very <laughs> mild way of putting it. Like I still can't believe that in spite of safe sports, you know, um, I guess lip service toward it, there's still not a searchable database for banned coaches. Um, you can actually can find it now. It's taken another organization called Great Coach to finally put this together. Uh, so if you go to greatcoach.com and register, you can actually see a comprehensive database. Um, you know, I again, I would, I would agree that just removing people or getting people like Larry Nasser in jail is just removing the, the tippy top of the, the iceberg. Our systemic changes need to be made. Um, so let's talk about the positive here. Uh, the Me Too movement isn't just, like you say, like whining people. There are strong voices for systemic change that needs to happen really on every level. Talking about the vertical integration, you know, uh, level of empowering the individual athlete, creating strictures around coaches, making sure that the governing bodies are accountable in every single way, and then making sure that entities like the USOC are there to serve athletes and to serve the coaches uh, in every way. Um, Jessica, really important question for you as, as a mom, right, whose daughter was involved in gymnastics as well. Can you talk about the role of the parent here in ensuring that athletes are, are safe? It's a, it's a great question. Um, and I think when every parent watched the victim impact statements, um, they were thinking of their child <laughs> and, and did I ever put my child in a situation like that? Um, and I know my own parents um, have, have some you know, difficulty thinking about what I went through and, and how th they may have been able to prevent that. What I tell parents now is that it's up to you to um, talk to your child about, um, to understand what grooming looks like. Because uh, typically with a coach-athlete situation, it occurs over a long period of time. And the, the athlete, um, the coach will develop a level of trust with the athlete and then also with the parents. So I think it's very important for parents to understand what grooming looks like and to then talk to your child about appropriate versus inappropriate behavior from a coach. So if you have um, a coach that is letting the athletes sit on their lap, um, you know, you have to call attention to that and, and uh, say that that's not acceptable. Um, we, we shouldn't be doing that. So I think being aware of what the process looks like might help you nip it in the bud. Um, and then secondly, I think a lot of parents hope or believe in some way that the organizations have taken steps to um, protect athletes. And that isn't always the case. So I think it's um, incumbent upon, um, pa upon parents to really look into what the organization that they're putting their child into it has done with respect to um, athlete safety, um, background checks of coaches, um, education for the coaches in terms of um, grooming, and then also enforcement. Um, is, is what are they doing with respect to 
um, getting rid of coaches in their um, in their employ. Mm -hmm. so it, it, uh, it, I was just going to say, sure. Jessica, if you wouldn't just mind sharing a little bit more personally about your, your own daughter who went to the same gym as, mm -hmm. as you. When she was starting gymnastics, did you have misgivings about that after what you had gone through? Maybe I did, you, you yes. Can talk about that, mm -hmm. that same kind My of My daughter started gymnastics at the same club where I had trained, and um, I started to, um, to, to to process what had happened to me in that context, um, even though it was you know thirty some years later, and so I did some um, work with my own um, therapist to talk to understand what I had experienced, and then I learned how to speak to her about what was happening. And so we had a lot of very open discussions. And by the time she was eleven, she came home and said, "Mom, I I'm, I don't want to go to that place anymore. It's dysfunctional." So um, <laughs> so I said. That's that's fine. She she didn't like um, the uh, nature of the environment. It was very um, abusive and, and destructive, and she didn't like getting yelled at. But more importantly, she didn't like seeing her friends and her teammates yelled at um, and forced to um, cover up injuries and um, just being told that they that they were fat uh, when they were 11 years old. And it, it, um, so I, I admire her strength and I admire her ability to say, I don't want to be in this environment. So you know, when your child says that to you. Um, and you're not too invested in their success, which is another uh, important issue, um, you have to really listen to them. Mm -hmm. Catherine. So um, it's Safe for Athletes that I started uh, like eight, eight years ago. Um, the, the whole structure, saferathletes.org or .com, you can, you can go there. There's a plethora of information, but we have how to address um, uh, uh, parents and athletes and everything you need. So the yes, structure. Great resources. Um, the she's done a good job. So the structure of Safe for Athletes is about uh, putting in policy at the local level. So uh, not every parent is going to be as concerning as you are and to be able to have that conversation. So we have video content, we have um, written content, but more importantly we have a policy that goes into every club. So it's like universal. So uh, we run, I run several Safe for Athletes uh, in different, various different sports around the country. And, um, and the th what's different and unique, it's not just the policies, it's a way to enforce them, mm -hmm. but they're required to have what uh, we refer to as an athlete welfare advocate. So there needs to be somebody who is not vested uh, outside of their family and outside of the, uh, the, the, the vestment of the club itself. So, uh, and, and, that, and you have a male and a female and so each individual athlete every year, they, they have awareness about what Safe for Athletes is, um, who they can go speak to. It's on their website. They have easy access to them. Uh, so you can have a conversation. So there's various issues, whether it's athlete on athlete, the age of technology. Um, we have um, uh, various uh, uh, issues that happen certainly amongst uh, teenage uh, interaction. Um, and uh, be able to hold people accountability for their actions. And there's a way to enforce it um, on top of that. So you, you have somebody to help you articulate uh, your issues so you're not left with trying to solve the problem yourself. Or commonly what happens is a 12-year-old is talking to another 12-year-old about how to solve a problem or how to ha have some mm -hmm. sort of uh, wisdom and how to uh, uh, deal with it. So you get a 12-year-old's answer. To a twelve, you know, having a twelve-year-old uh, in a problem that is uh, an adult wreckage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's why you need someone who who you can have that conversation with. So, whatever um, is holding you back, um, and then on top of that, we have a way to um, through our policies um, to mediate the issue out of the system immediately at the local level. So you're still going to respond, and you're still you send it through the NGB, send it through the safe se safe sports, send it through the police. But it offers you so it doesn't, uh, one, get progressive um, in the issue and um, as well as give you clear structure about how to handle any situation that would arise. So, uh, so it has uh, education mm -hmm. element, it has prevention element, and um, so every year uh, uh, coaches and athletes are held to this same standard, same set of rules. It's about 60 pages, so there's a lot of issues in there. And, and they're all um, I love, I love what Cap, the work that Catherine's done in this area, and she's provided a lot of great um, resources for parents. Um, unfortunately, this isn't mandated. 
you know, this is something that an individual club would have to adopt on their own. And Catherine and her organization have done a great job in getting clubs to do that, but uh, um, it's, it's optional at this point. That, that is correct, and I, that's what I write in Congress yeah. about, and they say what the problem is, and that's how I address it. Yeah. Right? But great so tools, if, and, if, and you sh if you're looking for you know, organizations to put your children into, you should be looking for organizations that have s either safe for athletes policies or something very similar. Mary, I want to get back to you because you've written about the um, symbolic annihilations, the absence of representation of, of women, of people of color, and it's been suggested that one way of, of empowering and combating this um, annihilation is to have more women in um, more women coaches, more women in more women sports writers, more women in the media. Some would say women are more sympathetic. I know you disagree with that, <laughs> but we were talking before. <laughs> Explain how this rising tide will lift all boats. Well, I disagree on the idea that having more women in any organization will necessarily combat abusive situations because women can be complicit just as men can. And women get caught up in the power structure just as men are. Uh, one of the primary alleged enablers in the Nasser case was a female coach yes. at Michigan State. Uh, the uh, children uh, in the Michael Jackson case, their mothers uh, were very complicit. Um, uh, horrified now, but their mothers were part of it. So I think that what is positive about having more women, people of color, different kinds of people inside newsrooms and then also represented uh, in media in different ways is that it normalizes women in what are traditionally male spaces. S it's, it's easier to bully a woman, put her aside, uh, treat her poorly, uh, or not care about her situation if she's in a situation or she's in a, uh, an organization, a place that is traditionally not hers, not her place. And so as we have more women in power uh, in decision-making positions in media, not just uh, appearance uh, positions in media, <coughs> as we have more women uh, in editing positions uh, in sports and more female coaches with real power, then it's normal to have men or women making big decisions and having a certain amount of power, and that is the power that lifts all boats. Um, I want to put out a question to, to everybody. Um, the underlying, I think, the, the key elements of the Me Too movement is what is the notion of what constitutes consent here. And uh, Jessica, you wrote about this very, very cogently, again, in, in your film, in your book, rather. Um, you know, it's never acceptable for coaches to act in certain ways or to be put in, in certain positions. Um, and Catherine, you write, quote, what is being asked of the athlete is to have the emotional intelligence to deal with issues that even adults wouldn't be able to, to deal with. So. Uh, sort of summing it up, what can we do or what must we do to take the onus off the athlete in, in reporting abuse? Well, um, so going back, like Lisa and Lisa said, one thing, policy should be, first of all, mandated in every sports environment, which would allow the abuse, one, not to progress, and two, to get out of the system. So that's why it's going to stay in there. So, um, and the problem is, is that there's, we have 50 states with 50 different definitions and federally uh, there's, an, I mean, the, the, it's a lower standard, right? So, so we have inconsistency, we have different, we have AU has a different standard, we have USOC and all the Olympic movement that has different requirements, you have, every, there's, somewhere about 80 million individuals that participate in some sort of activity, and then you have two to three within the Olympic movement. Two to three million. So one, you already have a, a, a structure of what's gonna be considered abuse within the Olympic environment. It's already been set up this way with the changes within the Ted Stephen Amateur Sports Act. And then you have other groups like cheerleading and little league and stuff like that, and, and basketball, for example, which is predominantly in the AAU, and they have a whole different uh, definition 
and a standard as to which they're going to hold to a view. So unless you have a, a uh, legal structure with clear definitions, a way to respond it, and the court system be able to handle it, you're going to have inconsistencies across sports. And if you look at like AU and basketball, I've dealt with several cases within there, and it's generally a lower income sport. So they're far more vulnerable, and there's far more abuse that stays in that mm -hmm. system. And they're, because they're not part of the USOC, they can't go through the Safe Sports Center. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would suggest also at a more grounded level that, that we need to talk to kids about sex more. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and we, you know, we watch a lot of it, and they watch a lot of it. Uh, but we need to get our children uh, comfortable talking to us about it mm -hmm. and being comfortable ourselves as parents to talk to children about sex. Mm -hmm. Use the right terms. Our children need to be comfortable saying penis and vulva and all the other things as much as they're comfortable saying ankle and elbow. Mm -hmm. um, because in order to be able to talk about these things, people need to be able to name it mm -hmm. and explain it. And if you have conversations with children early on, to be comfortable with their bodies and then also comfortable protecting and having body integrity, if you have those conversations mm -hmm. early, then as abuse or difficult situations happen, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And they'll be comfortable telling you or they won't be embarrassed to tell you and they won't feel like, if I tell mom, then mm -hmm. I'll get kicked off the team and mom will be sad. Children do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I always, my joke I always said if they ruled the world, that'd be awesome. And the first thing I would do is have sex ed starting in kindergarten. Um, and I have a, he's now 10 and a half, bless his little heart, um, he's grown up with me. But uh, you can have conversations with four year olds about consent. You don't have to talk about sex per se. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to my kid about it because that, I was trying to years wise, like I feel like that was around Sandusky and I started, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, crap. Um, but like, we're constantly negotiating consent in a whole range of ways. Uh, so for my son, it's a lot of um, the playground is a place where they're they're messing around, right? Like talking about like pushing other kids, or you know, it's like did did you have permission to do that? Like did that other kid it, that I say this all the time? Bless again, bless his heart. I'm always like everyone is in control of their own body. And just like you wouldn't want someone to do something to your body without permission, you need to do that with everyone else, right? And, and it, eventually we, I mean, he lives with me, so eventually we talk about sex with that. But like eventually you get there, but when you get there, you already have a language around consent, right? Um, my joke is always like, the other way that we're negotiating consent is I'll tell my, um, this is gonna be on TV too. I, uh, <laughs> I tell my mom like, please don't call me. Uh, I will be busy that day, then she calls. And it's like, I don't, what? There was a boundary. Um, <laughs> and now I'm, I'm And now she's mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're always doing that work. We just, it becomes a problem for us as a prudish society around sex. Um, but we can already start that language with children and with each other, right? To recognize that we're doing this work. Yeah, it's I'm going to cycle back into the, um, the coaching side of things since we were talking about on the sports side of things, mm -hmm. uh, there's no negotiation. Like you're- There can be no consent. Yeah. yeah. Right. So as Nancy says. Yeah, and so, yeah. I and, it, and it's also, you are at the, the um, you're beholden mm -hmm. to, this, to this relationship. So uh, one, you can't consent, there never should be, mm -hmm. and there isn't a natural negotiation, at least from my experience with my coaches, there was no natural, like, okay, I'm gonna do this set, or I'm gonna do this. Like, y there is, if I said, oh, I, I'm like tired, or I don't feel, like, there's a whole series of things that you just know to shut down, and you keep quieting mm -hmm. the voice, and, you, and it becomes less and less of you having any type of ability, and eventually, you've turned your whole life mm -hmm. over to this individual, mm -hmm. to your coach. You know, and so that's the part. There, it, we've lost all ability to negotiate. I mean, we saw it this year. We uh, Jordan McNair, who was a football player of Maryland, yeah. who died a preventable death on, you know, because no one would listen, like because mm -hmm. they were all deferring up to the top of the staff, and the staff, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, didn't make the choices that could have saved his life. Um, but it is that, you know, the sort of taunting that went along with it, mm -hmm. and like he was supposed to go through with it, and he died. I mean, 
to like the extreme, the extreme of this. And listen, as, as you are all too familiar, as elite athletes, you know that you have a very special relationship with your body, and it's not always a positive one. I mean, maybe supermodels are the category that have like a worse, more contentious <laughs> relationship with their bodies, but I would say athletes, you know, so you kind of can't always count on yourself as an athlete to say, all right, your, your coach it sh should be the one to say, look, this person is not looking so good. Sit out a set or you can't be in this competition. Um, I'm just saying it, like you as an athlete can't always find the way to, to give the consent in a, in a positive way. Um, I know you had that with overtraining, right? With yeah. your with your coach. Yes, at, at least three seasons, I was so overtrained that I could not perform for three or so months um, mm -hmm. because I would I would do everything that the coach said and disregard mm -hmm. training data or even the experiences of being an elite athlete for many years. I would defer to what the coach wanted, mm -hmm. um, which is. All of this is, it's so important for these organizations to actually take action on allegations. It shouldn't ever get to the point where, for instance, with Michael Crow and speed skating, the men on that team complained to their sports psychologists. The word got all the way up to the president of the federation and the allegations were buried. Um, there was just this toxic atmosphere on the team and they could have gotten rid of him before I even made my comeback mm -hmm. and started my elite years of competition, but they decided to keep him. And it's mm -hmm. so unfortunate when the people in power don't take the action that they should. Yeah. Well, it's like Craig Marisi said, uh, the mark of a good coach is one who is willing to subsume his or, own, his or her own glory to make their athlete better, and that is a very, very rare thing. Um, I see that our time is up. I want to thank everybody on the panel and everybody at uh, Dunwoody College. Thank you all. If I could have your attention for just one moment, I just want to say a couple of things very quickly. Um, first of all, I need to uh, thank the UT Center for Women's and Gender Studies as uh, a supporting sponsor for uh, this program. I uh, definitely want to say thanks to Christopher Hart, the program manager for the Center for Sports Communications and Media for uh, the logistical planning. Um, for those of you who are thinking that you wish you had some time for Q&A, I invite you to, uh, I, I hope I'm not putting the panelists in an awkward position, I invite you to come up and say hello afterwards. But also, um, from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, we'll be in the Center for Sports Communication and Media, which is CMB 3110, right next, uh, across the bridge. And uh, we'll have an open house uh, forum uh, there for you to be able to come uh, say hello and, and talk one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and small groups. And so we invite you to please come visit the center. Again, that's CMB 3110. Uh, so obviously there's so much more to be said. I want to give my sincere thanks to uh, Joel Yesko, Evan Rodansky, Jessica Armstrong, Catherine Starr, Mary Ann Labatt, Jessica Luther. Thank you all so much for um, sharing your voices, your experiences, and your expertise. Thank you all for coming.